Hi, everyone. Joining us today is Academy Award winner Pete Doctor. Pete, how do you like the sound of that? You know, I think that's the first time anyone's, uh, you know, introduced me that way. So that's pretty, that's pretty wild. <laughs> Well, seriously, congratulations on you. your Oscar win for Best Animated Feature Film, Up. And what kind of doors have opened up for you as, as a result of this Oscar win? Well, now I get to direct films at Pixar. Of course, I got that before. So, I, you know, so far it's just actually having the gold statue around is pretty wild It's when, to watch people's reaction. You know, actually coming back from L.A., we live in San Francisco. Where, where Pixar is and uh, you know you take your computer out of your backpack and the Oscar clunk, and put it through the the metal detector and you see the guy watching all this stuff and what you know so that is pretty cool <laughs> so can we expect a short on that someday <laughs> well probably not but it was a fun experience now coming from the national spotlight or international if you will um, I hear you're gonna be be uh, presented with the Texas Avery Award tonight here at the Dallas International Film Festival. I'm curious to know, um, being recognized at the local level, what does that mean to you personally? Well, Tex Avery was one of those guys that I grew up on his short films, and I love his cartoons. And so anything that says Tex Avery, I'm honored to be on the same piece of paper, you know. Um, he's just a great, great filmmaker, and I think all animators have learned from him, so uh, you know it's it's a pleasure to be here, uh, represented by by him. Very cool. And one of the things that I've always wanted to ask and, and try to read through the interviews, but I never found was how you went from being an animator to being a director. You know, you've picked up a lot of skills along the way, especially through your time at Pixar. So fill fill in the gap for us a little bit there. Yeah, I don't really know actually. Now that you bring that up, hmm. I hope nobody asked me too much about that back at work. It was kind of just, uh, there was a need and um, it basically, okay, so Toy Story is going on and a bunch of us started, it was a pretty small company at that time. And John, I think, more out of, because he, this is the way he likes to work, would just include Andrew Stanton and myself. It was the three of us and then eventually Joe Ramp that came on and developed the story and those characters. And then we just kept going. So when there'd be recording sessions with Tom Hanks, John would include me and Andrew. When there'd be you know orchestra scoring sessions, we'd get to go. So I got this firsthand training on how to direct a feature film just by watching John do it and, and participating in it. So um, when it came time for John to take, finally take a break after doing you know, Toy Story and Bugs Life and Toy Story 2, uh, he was fried, because even one of these is a, a Herculean task, and he did three in a row. I still don't know how he's standing. But um, so I got to take on Monsters, and I had seen it happen, and uh, I guess that's basically how, you know, I, I think a lot of it too has to do with, at least at Pixar, the, the lion's share of the job is storytelling really getting those characters to work, making sure that you care what's gonna happen next. And so um, it was really my experience in story probably more than even in animation and as a filmmaker, you know, because regardless of the medium, be it hand-drawn or live action or a short film or puppets or whatever, it's always about the story and characters. Right, that's right. And, and that's something that I think contributes to why Pixar has been successful hit after hit after hit. Still have yet to see a bomb. Well, I mean, the truth is they're all bombs at, at some point. It's just that we allow ourselves to fix them, you know, and that's really part of the process, too, is we allow ourselves to make mistakes. But then we have this great support group of other directors who are doing their own thing, but we steal them all away at key moments to watch each other's work and comment and make suggestions. And uh, that's uh, I don't know where this term came from, the brain trust, which is sort of pompous sounding, but it's it's all these other directors that, that get together. And I think, like I said, that's been really one of the keys to, uh, to our success. Very good. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, speaking to that, on the collaborative standpoint, you know, when it, they say it all comes down to the script, you know, and when you're developing the character and the storyline and the fact that this up was a true story, you know, in, in a lot of different ways. How did you develop all those, as well as how did you balance that with delivering the message of grief? Because that can be such a touchy subject and can be very hard to display some of those those pivotal moments where it's just like, oh, and you, and you hmm. want the audience to empathize. How did you guys develop all of that? 
Well, really, that whole film started with, and there's no real rules to this. Every film is different. Like monsters, I just sort of had this idea of, I wonder if, you know, I knew there were monsters when I was growing up. I knew that there were monsters in my closet waiting to scare me. And then just kind of exploring why. Why, What do they they get out of it, you know? And that's kind of what led to the story. In this case, Bob Peterson and myself had always wanted to do something with a grouchy old man character. So we drew a lot of stuff and we talked about what he would be like and how entertaining that would be. And then we also came up with this idea of a floating house and we kind of paired the two. And really getting to the grief stuff was working backwards answering the question, why is this old man floating his house away? Where is he going that he couldn't just take the train or uh, you know, stay home for that matter? What's so important to him that he needs to fly his house away? And so answering that question, working backwards, we developed this whole backstory of the life together and the unfinished dream and the unfulfilled promise and so on. So it's a lot of kind of back and forth hopping around in the story. Um, I always had this, I'm sorry, this is a long answer to your question. No, Go it's on. perfectly fine. Okay. Um, I always had this idea as a kid that when you go to a movie, it feels like when the movies are well done, it feels like it just sprung fully formed out of somebody's head. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but that's now seeing the backside of it. That's not the way it works at all. <laughs> it's all a big trick. It's um, a messy, nonlinear process that's kind of like chaos. But in the end, that's what you're aiming for is this whole kind of thing that fits together all elements relate to each other and uh, support the theme of the film but getting there is a mess yeah well, <laughs> and it's it's trying to undo the mess you know and trying to make it work and make it linear yeah now how did you interweave the true story of, of this all and then or how did you come across the people that you guys had dedicated it to and who were your inspiration ultimately yeah and it wasn't so much that we necessarily based anything in terms of events on them but there were certain people uh in my life and in uh uh, in the case of watching our own grandparents that you look at and you go okay these a husband and wife been married for 50 years and you go to their house and you can see that history everywhere the the light switches have layer upon layer of dirt and you know just from fingertips have been worn down so that you can't read the on and off anymore and you look through their picture albums and the life they've lived and all the stories they have to tell that was really inspiring to us initially we were thinking just gags old grouchy man he's gonna be funny <laughs> and then as we got into that stuff you realized boy this has a real weight to it yeah. And that's ultimately, of course, what we're looking for in our films is something that you can take home. In fact, one of the guys that we dedicated it to, Joe Grant, he was a head of story on Dumbo. He designed the Snow White, not not the lead character, but the the witch. Um, He worked with Walt Disney back in the day. I got to know him. And that's something, as I would pitch him this story, he'd always talk about, well, what are you giving the audience to take home? And I think by that he meant what's the emotional gravity that people can relate to that they'll think about after the lights come up, you know? Yeah, well, definitely very well achieved, you know, and in, in not only in the storyline but also in all of y'all's lives and how you developed it entirely. So thanks. Yes, I just have one question, really. How important is it to you to make family films? I mean, is that just kind of part of your job as an animator that they that they end up being family friendly? Well, I think the simplest answer to that probably is that we make the films for ourselves like we don't think okay this I'm going to aim this to a 14 year old or a 7 year old or anything we just try to entertain each other so these are the movies that I want to go see the type of film that I want to go to the theater to watch that's the movies I'm trying to make Um, and so you know I'm always kind of conscious that my kids are going to see it but I'm really trying to aim for something that that an adult will be able to pick up on and and be intrigued with as well. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You're watching The Truth Behind Storytelling with Pete Doctor at the Dallas International Film Festival. Pete, thanks again for dropping by. Hey, thank you. That was fun.